Say that again. That was a good quote. Let's quote you on that. Well, I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> but if you wait till the perfect time, you never do anything. That part. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Reddit. Reddit. Reddit's been a little off lately, so mm. I'd like to see how you react to these. People Mike, need to get outside. Mike did pretty well, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, expungement of criminal record questions. Ready? Yep. So I recently graduated from college with a business degree, and unfortunately I've made some mistakes when I was younger, which caused me to have a felony and misdemeanor on my record. I wanted to see if you guys have any suggestions or anything I can do to clean up my record. Some states allow expungement. New York is one of those states. Uh, most crimes, not violent crimes, not sexual crimes, but if it's been 10 years and you have two or less, you can get an expungement. Ha Separate and apart from that. Mm -hmm. You can go hire a lawyer, go back to the DA, and, and make some sort of an application as to why it would be fundamentally fair. Um, and if you have turned your life around, I think you should make those applications, and they are granted sometimes. Great. Well, you just answered two of my follow-up questions, so that was quick. Um, all right. I feel like you're so far away, too. I, I think you're, you're in frame. There we go. Okay. So, violation of parole. Don't I, do it. Oh. <laughs> okay. There you go. Um, all right. So, I have a family member who was convicted and received a 30-year sentence in Texas. I know we're in New York, but hold on. Texas is crazy. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare take the name of Texas in vain. <laughs> um, he is granted parole after doing 18 years. Although the crime was committed in Texas, they let him be released to his home state in New York with an ankle monitor. My question is, if he violates parole and gets locked up in New York, is his parole going to be revoked and go back to Texas? Or how does that work? Yep, so he's on parole to the judge or the state that he was put on parole to. Mm -hmm. So he's on parole in Texas. Uh, no, he's the, on parole in New York. Well, he's on parole to Texas. Mm -hmm. He happens to be residing in New York right now. Okay. So parole oversight could be transferred, but I believe he would go back to Texas if he violated to see the judge in Texas to go back in. Okay. Even if he committed a new crime in New York, then because it would be a he, violation, right? If he committed, but you can violate parole a lot of different ways by violating curfew, by not checking in with your parole officer, or by committing a new crime. If you commit a new crime, then you got two problems: Texas and New York. Gotcha. Okay. So, criminal background questions for scholarship application. So, I'm 26. I'm always going to be 26. <laughs> I'm 26, currently in the process of applying for MBA, MBA scholarship. I need help answering a question that pertains to my criminal history. I received an underage drinking ticket when I was 18, where this was considered a non-criminal offense. Even though this is technically not a crime, the application asks to disclose any criminal-related offenses related to drugs and alcohol. I'm not sure if this falls into the definition of how the application defines a crime. No, say no. It's not a crime. It never was a crime. My guess is it was also probably dismissed at the time. So cases that are dismissed, you don't have to disclose. Cases that are sealed. So in New York, oftentimes we'll get a reduction to a violation level offense, non-criminal outcome. Mm -hmm. If they ask you, have you ever been arrested? The answer is no. Uh, the exception to that is security clearances and applications to law enforcement. There's a question that you'll sometimes get that says, have you ever had police contact? And if that's the question, you better, one, talk to a lawyer, or two, disclose that you've had police contact because they're going to know. So that's how they get you. They're like, have you ever been in contact with the police? And Correct. then that kind of... But if you've been arrested and the case has been sealed or dismissed, you don't have to disclose that on a general employment form. It's as if you were innocent, so you don't have to say it. Mm -hmm. Whether you were or whether you weren't, the court system said that this record is sealed. You don't have to tell anyone. Right. So it's more, I mean, typically, these questions are typically like what you're convicted of, not necessarily That's Correct. And it's usually, usually they're worried about felonies. Gotcha. I'm gonna, I'll tell you this after. Okay. So... 
Seeing as you can't be tried twice for the same crime, what would happen if you yelled, you idiots, I was guilty the whole time, immediately after being declared innocent? Uh, this is the one we should ask a lot of lawyers because I've always wondered this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's generally not a good idea. Why? Um, under letter of the law, could you try that? Sure, and, mm -hmm. and everybody's gonna say it's double jeopardy, and you can't try somebody twice. But it also is gonna piss off the police. It's gonna piss off the prosecutor. It's gonna piss off the judge. And, and maybe you're good with that. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's what you're trying to accomplish. But it seems like it kind of. <laughs> well, my guess is one, the person who wants to yell that, it's probably mm -hmm. not the only crime they've ever committed. So you're gonna bring a lot of investigation towards yourself. And, and you might be living a lifestyle that you don't want a lot of police around for. So it's, it's a way to get a lot of attention mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. And, and you know our, our buddy Mike, he has his own theories about the sovereigns and um, could you be prosecuted? Literally, because I asked him the same exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been talking about it for weeks. Um, could you <laughs> be prosecuted? So here in New York, you have state court and federal court, and that's how most states are, really all states in the US. Um, if you're, If the elements of the crime are not identical, you can sometimes be prosecuted for something similar. Um, and I know the example that he gives is a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. If you're prosecuted for murder in state court um, with, with the allegation that you had an illegal handgun, they didn't prosecute the handgun in state court. Well, now you get off. Can they prosecute you for the gun in federal court? And, and the answer to that is yes. If the elements are different, you, it's not double jeopardy because it's not the same crime. Interesting. Can they ever be prosecuted at the same time? federal and state court. Mm -hmm. uh, like they kind of team up and they're like, well, we're going to state will charge this and federal will charge this. That, that does happen. So they, like uh, parallel prosecutions, it happens mm -hmm. sometimes. It's a lot of resources. It's a lot of lawyers prosecuting the same person. Typically, um, there'll be meetings between prosecution offices where they decide what makes more sense to prosecute at the, the state level or the federal level. So crimes involving drugs and guns, Oftentimes, there's a harsher sentence in federal court, so the U.S. Attorney's Office will take those cases. The state won't prosecute. Mm -hmm. And there's other, sometimes white-collar cases, um, things involving theft or larceny, sometimes the, the potential sentences are actually harder in state court here in New York. Are there ever times where someone leaves the courtroom innocent and then has police waiting for them outside on a new charge? <laughs> Sure. There's a lot of. Uh, I'm just saying, does it happen? Could it happen? Uh, the one you'll hear about sometimes too is somebody's in jail on a relatively minor offense, and they investigate them while they're in jail, and they get released, um, and then they get grabbed the minute they get out the jail. The yeah. other, the other police agency is there waiting for them. Um, it happens, but probably not like. Yeah, as often as it used to happen, it used to happen more. I don't think it happens quite as much. Civil stuff. We've been going all over New York. We're representing uh, a whole bunch of municipalities for contaminated water. Mm -hmm. um, PFAS settlement was outlined in June of this year. Um, a triple F multi district litigation and PFAS forever chemicals. It's starting to get some pretty good news, and we're all over the place. Um, I feel like people don't really understand what PFAS is or the significance behind it because it's kind of, if you just, I don't know, like, it, I don't really think people understand how bad this is. Yeah, PFAS is scary because it's a, a man-made chemical that doesn't break down. And that's why it's highly effective. It's used to put out fires of jet fuel. Mm -hmm. So the fires get smothered instead of put out with water, mm -hmm. uh, water won't put out jet fuel fires. It's also used in things like Teflon cookware, waterproof clothing, it doesn't break down. And that's why it's effective in certain consumer products, maybe outdoor carpets, things like that. Uh, the PFAS gets into the ground, it gets into the water, and it doesn't go away. So we're talking about half-life of potentially thousands of years, and the stuff's in the water, it's known to cause cancer, um, bad thyroid, high cholesterol preeclampsia, a number of um, illnesses and various different types of cancer. So there's a settlement last summer and 
all the municipalities, even if you have a little bit in there, it's amazing to me that the municipalities don't know that they qualified. And that's that's our job as lawyers to let them know. And uh, Well, it's also not something that you would maybe know to check for unless something has come up prior. Yeah. And is it, I don't think it's something that like your Brita filter can filter out, right? Yeah, there's a lot of questions about it. So active carbon can filter PFAS mm-hmm. in some levels and that's happening. So it's also, I get frustrated with the state of New York. We have too much government. But in this case, um, New York has one of the most restrictive PFAS laws, New York State Department of Health, um, 10 parts per trillion. It's the most aggressive in the entire United States. And the testing here in New York is is required. So all of our municipalities know whether or not they have it. And it's about half do and half don't. Mm-hmm. And other states, th- th- there's no testing required. They don't know. The people do not know. And um, every municipality that provides water in New York State has to tell the people what's in the water. Mm-hmm. And, and that's lead and all sorts of contaminants, turbidity, which is like the dirt in the water, all that stuff. Right. It's measured really, really carefully. And um, it's amazing. You take it for granted. And, and then when you start working on yeah. a case like this, uh, the entire state of Florida, only one wow. municipality qualifies for this settlement. And it's not because they don't have contaminated sites. It's because no one tested. Wow. So is it too late to test now? It's not too late to test now. You should test now. If you're a water provider anywhere in the U.S., you should be testing. Uh, but the money is broken up into phase one and phase two. And if you had a test prior to the, the June 2023 date, you're going to phase one. That's about two thirds of the money. So everybody else is going to get one third of the money. But here in New York, um, all the municipalities that we're representing are phase one. Gotcha. And so we're talking about towns and cities, but does that apply to individuals as well? Or how does that? Yeah, there's um, water providers in general. So you have private water companies. You can have things like uh, like a trailer park, for example, might have one well and provide water to 50 or 75 houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's something that that could be explored, certainly. but mostly what we're talking about are towns and cities that are providing water. And um, so we're on the South Shore of Lake Ontario. It's obviously, you have all the Great Lakes. Upstream from us is Flint, Michigan, Cleveland, Ohio, Niagara Falls, these uh, relatively industrial areas. And there's PFAS in all of Lake Ontario. So we have these municipalities along the lake shore and everybody's drawing their water out of a Great Lake, should be clean, but there's there's PFAS in it. Mm, Interesting. I, and I always wonder about the water in Pittsburgh, because you know, like all the bridges and like those are all steel towns. Yeah, that's where They're, that's where the river caught on fire that one time, right? In the seventies. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. So I don't. Who knows? It's been really interesting to be involved. Um, shout out to our buddy Mike Stag, um, Stag Lauza down in New Orleans. He's uh, he, he's been working with us on these cases. He's really top environmental lawyer. We talk like, it seems like every day or close mm-hmm. to it and learned a ton, a ton from him and his experience. He did BP oil, um, a lot of cases involving wells and contamination from drilling wells in the South. So you think that environmental contamination can't happen to you. I mean, I'm representing the town that I grew up in, town of Ontario, and I drank the water myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to present to the, the board and I said, yeah, these these things happen and i think pfos hopefully the story in the end is a positive one it didn't get to the point where it could have been like pittsburgh in the 70s mm-hmm. we got out ahead of it hopefully soon enough and uh, the case got resolved and it's the municipalities are learning and and they're learning before it's you know hopefully too late mm-hmm. all right 